Welcome to First Methodist Houston on this wonderfully beautiful Sunday morning. We would like to welcome all those that are worshiping for the first time as visitors with us or returning visitors and those worshiping online and on television. Welcome. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Gracious God, you are good and you have called us here today to teach us, to challenge us, to heal us, and to make us new. Open our hearts and minds as we worship you, that way we may be grounded in your love and sent out to spread hope, peace, and joy throughout the world. All of this we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our hymn of welcome. You may be seated. This Thanksgiving, we are collecting food that will benefit our ministry neighbors in action and other members of our church who are in need of food. Donations will be collected at both campuses on Sunday, October 27th, on Sunday, November 3rd, and on Sunday, November 10th. Donation locations are located at both campuses, on the West Campus and the Atrium, and in the lobby of our downtown campus. You can also donate funds to this effort by visiting fmmissions.com forward slash Thanksgiving in a bag. And our goal this year is to feed over 100 families. So please join us in that effort. Through your gracious giving, we are able to be a church that puts God's love into action serving people in Houston and across the globe, and we also serve one another and build one another up. So during the offering, if you will find the registration pads in the pews, sign your name, pass it to your neighbor, look at your neighbor's name, and give them a word of encouragement this morning. 
As the ushers come forward, let us go to the Lord in prayer together. God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. We are stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. As we return a portion of what you have given, please build up your church so that we may be even more faithful in our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ by transforming lives and communities and putting God's love, your love, into action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you're seated, I would like to invite children of all ages to come down and have a children's moment with Courtney Hutchins. So come on down. making their way down. <laughs> okay, we got a few, so I'm going to need y'all's help today. Come on. Come on down, Molly. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you if you've ever heard about a story called Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Have you ever heard that story before? Yeah. Okay. Um, Lucy looked really eager. Can you tell us, what is that story about, Lucy? Do you want to tell us in the microphone? Um, no. Do you want to just tell me and I can say it into the microphone? No? Anybody, what's the, Goldilocks, I mean, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Yeah, what is that about? Okay. I'm going to have one of the bigger kids help us. Okay. Tell us the quick version. So, there's a girl and her name is Goldilocks, of course. <laughs> and she goes to this house in the woods and there's three bowls, three chairs, and three beds. And she tries all three of them. Two of them don't work. And one of them is just right. Okay, now at the end of the story, what happens to Goldilocks? Who comes home? The bears, right? Now, Goldilocks is a pretty easy story that teaches us, like, it's not good to go into people's houses uninvited, right? When you read that story, that's a really good lesson that you learn, right? Don't just go over to people's houses and start helping yourself to those things, right? So it's a simple story about bears and a little girl that helps us understand a bigger lesson. Sometimes Jesus really wanted people to understand things too. And sometimes the lessons he was teaching were really hard things. And so he would tell simple stories called parables to help people understand the thing. So I'm going to share a parable today with you guys that Jesus told some people a long time ago. So there were two men that decided to build a house. And the two men went out looking for the place that they were going to build their house. Now, the first man was very wise. He thought so carefully about the kind of house that he wanted, and he wanted a house that was strong. If there was wind or rain or any of those things, he didn't want his house to just wash away or break up. And so this wise man knew that the most important part of his house that he could build was the foundation. That's the very bottom part of the house. The foundation is the first thing that they build. And the foundation has to be really sturdy and strong for you to have a really sturdy, strong house. And so he looked everywhere and he found the perfect place. He found a huge flat rock. Now his rock was a lot bigger than this rock, but he found this huge flat and hard and sturdy rock that he could build his house on. And he dug and he chipped around the rock until it was the perfect size for his house. And he built his house 
on top of the rock. And after he lived in the, in, built his house, he lived in the house, and so many times the storms came and the winds blew and the rains, but his house stood strong. He sat comfortably in his house and he didn't have to worry about his house because he knew he built it strong. Now, in Jesus' parable, he told us about the second guy who built his house. And this man was a little bit foolish. He didn't make the best decisions. And he didn't think carefully about the kind of house he wanted. He just wanted a house. So he found a nice flat place and he just started building. And he built his house on sand. Now the foundation kept slipping and sliding in the sand. You can see what happens to the sand as I shake it around. But the foolish builder didn't care. He just wanted his house built. He wanted to have a house to live in. And so when his house came, was finished building and he moved in, guess what happened when the very first storm came? The winds blew, the rains came, and his house just washed away, fell apart. Because it didn't have a strong foundation. He didn't build it on something strong. He built it on soft sand. And so after Jesus told the parable, he explained what it really meant. Like how Goldilocks really is about like, don't go in people's houses. He was like, this is what this story means. He said the wise man was kind of like someone who listened to Jesus's instructions and followed the instructions. Because we know Jesus is always right. When a person builds their life on Jesus's words and the promises that he makes to us, they're building a really strong foundation. Inside, they're going to be so strong because they will have the faith and the hope that when things get hard, that Jesus is always there with them. Now, the foolish man in the parable, the guy who built his house on that soft, soft sand, was like somebody who listened to Jesus' instructions, but then didn't follow them. A person who doesn't build their life on Jesus' words and promises won't have that strong foundation. They'll be kind of weak inside. They're going to really struggle when things get hard because they don't know the hope and the promise of Jesus, right? So right now, as kids, you are still working on building your foundation. You're going to have experiences that are going to help you learn and help you grow and help mold you into the person you are as you become a grown-up. And there are a lot of things that you get to choose. You can choose to read your Bible. You can choose to spend time praying to God. You can uh, choose to find friends who also want to learn more about God. And you can make sure your parents wake up on Sunday mornings to bring you to church, right? And that you get to come and spend time with other people at church learning about God. And so you can be like the wise builder and build your foundation on God so that when things get really tough, you, have Jesus, you know Jesus is inside of you and you have all of his hope and his promises to get you through the hard times. So let's pray for that this morning. God, thank you so much for putting Jesus in our hearts and help us to remember that so that we can have that strong foundation. We know that when things get hard, when the rains and the winds come, that Jesus is always there. He's always with us and he loves us. In your name we pray, amen. Now, we're making a little switch today, so grown-ups, if you have kiddos coming to kids' church, you're going to want to know this, but we are going to dismiss and go into the first floor space. So for pickup, we're going to be in the first floor. So we will dismiss to kids' church while the rest of us stand to sing.
we hear our scripture this morning, coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 23. As we hear these verses, Paul is someone who uses a lot of words. He's robust with words. So I want you to just be listening to the scripture, and I want to encourage you to listen for three metaphors that he uses to describe what the church ought to be about. Let us hear this word. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and each one will receive wages according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers, working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and then someone else is building on it. Let each builder choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, the work of each builder will become visible for the day, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work has been done. If the work that someone has built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a wage. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast about people, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ. And Christ is God's. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated as we bow for a word of prayer. Almighty and gracious God, as we worship this morning, as we worship through fellowship, as we worship in community, hearing and singing the songs of faith, hearing the holy word, may we be grounded in you. May we be grounded in your love and your grace and your mercy. So as we go out into this world this week, we reflect your goodness. We do the work of your kingdom as you have called us to be, to do. So that as we go about, we are the people and the church that you have called us to be. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Today, as we continue in our stewardship series, we are focusing on abundantly more. What does it look like to have abundance in all that we have? And our theme is rooted in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Now to him who has the power. Who has the power to do more? God, yes. And through him we are able to do abundantly more. Now, all of this, how do we get to that point? You have to back up a little bit more in Ephesians and look at verses 14 through 18. I wonder if we have that on the screen this morning. There we go. So when we look at it, we see that there is work that has to be done that we are called to be co-laborers in so that we can experience that abundance beyond all of our imagination. 
And so our series is rooted in this work. It's not just a series, but how do we experience God's abundance is about being about the work that is described here in Ephesians. And there are four verbs that are lifted up. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with the power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all saints and what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So there's those four verbs, being strengthened, rooted, grounded, and fulfilled. It's in doing that work that we have those words and we live into those verbs that we are enabled to experience the abundance. So today we focus on being grounded. And we look at this text from 1 Corinthians where Paul is writing this letter to this community of the early church. Now it's important to understand when we read Paul's writing, that little reminder, we're reading someone's mail. So you think, does it really fit with me right now? There might be a few pieces that feel a little out of sync, but remember we're reading someone's mail. But more importantly, throughout our text this morning, when it says you, the audience is the church. So it's plural. So anytime you hear the word you, you should hear the word y'all. If Paul was a good Texan, he would be saying, y'all need to understand this. Y'all need to be about this work. Y'all need to build a foundation in this way. And so Paul uses three metaphors. What does it look like? What is, it, what is the work of being grounded? Now, as we look at those three, I wonder if you heard as we are reading the scripture, there's church as God's field, church as God's building, church as God's temple. And it's important to understand he's not talking about the institution. He's not necessarily talking about the physical building. He's talking about the church as the community, the people. Remember last week, Pastor Lance was talking about being rooted. And when we come together and we're doing that work and we're interconnected, and we remember that we are about that same work, there is strength in that. And so Paul is talking about us as a community. And so when we say, y'all, it's all of us. It's not just this beautiful, glorious building. It's not about an institution or the United Methodist Church. It's about the people and what they are accomplishing as they come together to do that work. Now, when we look at this first metaphor, we're talking about the field. I think it's important to go back to a lesson that we have reviewed over the last few years of remembering who is God. God is God, we are not. And the important piece of understanding this, this metaphor is understanding what our role is. Now, some people don't like the phrase, stay in your lane. So that's where I like to use the, the wording that, remember that God is God and we are not. Part of remaining grounded is remember that we're not God. We're called to do the work, but we're not God. There's our work and there's the work that God does. And so throughout this metaphor, we see that they are out there doing the work. A few weeks ago, the pastoral team had the opportunity to go to Kansas City. We heard from Dr. Candace Lewis, who is a dean of Gammon Theological Seminary. And she did a great job of really talking to us about and using the parable of planting seeds. Back in the Gospel of Matthew, we hear about scattering all of the seeds. And we are to be fruitful in all seasons. As we went through that lesson and listening to her, she was pretty powerful and persuasive in reminding us that our job is to take care of the seeds, to tend to them, to nurture them, to plant them, so that they could become fruit-bearing. They would become fruit-bearing trees. However, as she pointed out very, very clearly and very dramatically, our human tendency 
is to look around and say, where has already God scattered trees? We look to God and say, where is the tree already planted? Where is the tree already matured? But that's not what God is doing. He gives us the seeds, and we are to be about the work. We're to be about the work of scattering them, planting them in good, healthy soil, nurturing them, tending to them, and then God is about the work of that tree growing so that it becomes fruit-bearing. And she would tell us again and again, you're to be about scattering the seeds. God doesn't just say, bibbidi-bobbidi-boo, here's a mature tree, here's a tree, and here's a tree. God says, here are the seeds, now do the work. Do the work of tending to it so that it can become fruit-bearing. And yet so often, in the busyness of life, after this many years of established religion and faith, we can kind of tend to just look for the trees that are already mature, the trees that have already been planted and tended to by previous faithful generations, and just go and rest under those, to go and simply enjoy the fruit of those mature trees and forget that we are called to do the work. We're called to do the work to continue to not only tend to that tree, but take the seeds that come from it and plant them again, nourish them again, tend to them again so they continue to bear more fruitful trees. Again and again, we are called to be about the work of tending to that seed so that God can be about the work of growing it into a fruitful tree. Dr. Lewis reminded us that often there will be trees that we sit under and we will enjoy the shade that we didn't have about the work. There are often times we're going to plant seeds and we will never get to benefit from the shade of that tree. And yet we're called to continue to do the work again and again. In this metaphor that Paul is using, we often look at it and say, well, surely it was easier then to be planting good, healthy, faithful communities where all was well and everyone was living in harmony because it's original church. Surely all was well. Here's the thing about the church. They're full of people, full of humans. A perfect group of imperfect people. God gave us hearts and minds. We have reason. And we believe a little bit differently. We think a little differently. And from time to time, we disagree. We disagree on should we worship this way or this way? Should we believe this is what the Bible is telling us or this? And we can find ourselves being divided. We can find ourselves in factions and in small groups. And what we hear in Paul's metaphor is that the people in the church, early church had already started sifting themselves out and saying, oh, well, we're on Paul's team. Well, we're on Apollo's team. Well, we're on this team. Paul says, you shouldn't be about whose team you're on. God has called us all to be about the work. The work of planting the seed, of caring for it, watering it, nurturing it, we're all called to do that work. And what what fruit it bears, because that is the work that God has done. It's not because of what Paul did. It's not because what Apollos did. But God produced that through the work that you all did, the work that you are all called to. So Paul reminds them, We're called to go out there and simply be field hands. We're simply called to do the work. But just because the tree over here, over in Brant's field, might grow and produce apples, and this one over here produces oranges, doesn't mean this crop is any better. It doesn't mean that this one is less than or that that leader is more important or more holier than this one. We are all called to do the work of the church and be about that work together. And so Paul reminds them, we're on the same team, same project, same collaboration at building God's kingdom. So get to doing the work and do it together versus dividing it out where it's not as strong and fruitful. 
And so then Paul goes into the, me the next metaphor. And he goes from the field to building a foundation. Very much of what Miss Courtney was talking about. Building on a solid foundation. Now here's the interesting piece. When we read our scripture verses from our different Bibles, I think if we took a survey of this room, there'd probably be, I don't know, seven different versions. Some of you would have King James. Some would have NIV. Some in RSV, which is we read on the screen. Maybe a living translation. There's all different translations. And sometimes when we read different translations, we lose the intent of the original Greek or the original language that that text was written in. Today's text, we see that uh, in this next metaphor. Because what you see in NRSV, it says, for those who choose various building materials. In the original Greek, what he actually says is take care in how you build and how you build your foundation. He doesn't use the word choice. He says, take care in how you do it. You see, it's not the, the original foundation of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf. This one chose straw, this one chose stick, and this one chose brick. The one that stood is the wise. That's not what this is about. What Paul is talking about is integrity and intentionality. Take care in how you're building the foundation of the church. Take care and be intentional and have integrity in how you go about being the church. That's what he was talking about. Not necessarily which supplies, but take care and be faithful in the work that you are doing. Recently, I had the chance to go to Newport, Rhode Island. Maybe you've been there and you've gotten to walk along the cliff walk and see these great big mansions of the Gilded Ages. I said Gilded Ages, shows the HBO show. Um, but you get to see uh, that great generation and these mansions that they built. One of them was from Cornelius II, uh, built the Breakers Mansion. Now the first one he built mainly was out of wood. A fire came through, destroyed it, he rebuilt it. This time to be fortified and to withstand fire and storms. Over a century's worth of storms, hurricanes, drought, everything. He built this huge mansion out of steel and concrete. That foundation has withstood the stand, the, throughout the time all the storms that have come its way. He had that fortified foundation. It's interesting when you walk through this mansion, the strength that they put in there. The other piece I appreciated and along the lines of what Paul talks about in appreciating and understanding the community, the strengths of the church, is that in the Breaker's Mansion, each room reflects incredible beauty and the gathering of artifacts from all over the world. There are places where they have architecture and fireplaces from Russia. There are places, different rooms that they have brought artifacts from Austria. All these different things that are brought together to have this incredible, beautiful mansion. And as I walked through room to room, I thought about the way that God calls us together. Some of us bring certain gifts that look shiny and impressive, like you see on that first floor, those incredible leadership tasks. Then there are other smaller, quiet gifts, gifts of hospitality, the gifts of simply having doors open and making coffee and picking up trash that people might not see. But God brings each and every one of our gifts to build this incredible community, this incredible kingdom. And he continues to add and build to it again and again. Later on in this metaphor, Paul talks about, he lists six different materials. Again, it's not the origins of the pigs and the big bad wolf building their house. There are three that are destructible and three that are not. Three that can withstand. What he's talking about is building with intentionality and integrity versus holy fluff, 
not something that just looks fancy on the outside, that can't withstand the test of time, that can't withstand plagues and storms and droughts and everything else, but building something with integrity, intentionality, that can withstand everything that life throws at it. He says if we're grounded and we're being the church that God has called us to be, we're going to be like those three, the, the, we're going to be building on a foundation that is solid, like the three pieces, the three ingredients that he talked about, of steel and brick and mortar. When you look at that, it's about intentionality and integrity. When we reflect on the work that we're doing in the church, are we being intentional about doing the work of being the field hands? Whose seeds are we nourishing? Uh, There's a wonderful Sunday school class that is passionate about making sure that children have the faithful stories throughout the year. And they help sponsor those Bibles for third graders that we celebrated last week. There are people who come along and say, it is important for children to be a part of Vacation Bible Camp. So they nourish those seeds. There are others that say, we've got to have this incredible thing where people can come in and experience God's presence. And so we are going to have Stephen's Ministries so that when people are walking through a difficult season, there is someone that they can come and they can listen to and that they know that God is with them in the most difficult season. Those are some of the examples about being intentional in the work that God is calling us to be about. But remember, Paul's letter is written to y'all. So it's all of us. We can't simply say, oh, this person over here has it. I'm just going to sit back under this shade tree and let it happen. We are all called to be a part of that work. We are part of doing the work and building the solid foundation. Now he steps into the third metaphor. It's really just expanding this middle one to say, you're not building just any foundation. You're building the foundation of God's temple, where people will experience God's grace, God's light, and not the physical temple, but when you gather as God's people, as the community, that is where God resides. When you are gathered and about doing God's work, that is the temple, and that is the foundation in which you are building. It was interesting when we were walking through the mansions, there was another one named Rosecliff. This was all about hosting these parties that they were well known for. But the interesting thing is, this is way back when electricity was just becoming a new thing. And so sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But what was interesting in the Rosecliff mansion is that there was wallpaper that was created from platinum and gold leaf. Now, at first you might think, well, that's kind of ritzy and just showing off the wealth they had until you listen to the fact that it was so that when the lights went dim or if the lights weren't working and it was just a candlelit room, the sunset and the little bit of candle, a little bit of candlelight would reflect. It would reflect and make that light be even bigger and more abundant than they could have ever experienced in a different place. It reminds me of what we're called to be about when we're building that foundation, when we're called to resemble God's temple. We are called to reflect God's light so that anybody that is going by us can say, wow, I know God is alive and well in them. They are about God's work. So God, so Paul uses these metaphors that we're to be about the work. And when it becomes, when we see the fruit and it is incredible and it's glorious and the harvest is wonderful, it's not about the individual leaders. It's about God's work. God produces the harvest. We're simply the field hands. And when we are about doing that work and laying the foundation of the church, we are to do so with intentionality and integrity. And then throughout all of that, reflecting God's presence within us. Paul wraps this up talking about wisdom. 
wisdom and foolishness. You might think he's talked about this back and forth, but I think it's an important word for us as we have some important weeks ahead of us. You see, in that season, those who were considered most wise were the ones who could speak eloquently. Those who were smooth talkers, who could just let words flow out, they were the ones considered wise. For Paul, that is not where his wisdom was rooted. His wisdom is rooted in the cross. And it makes us think this morning, as we are going out into the world, as we are reflecting on God's, as we are reflecting God's light, where is our wisdom rooted? Is it rooted in the things that we hear and we simply pare it back? Is our wisdom rooted in what people have taught us throughout the years? Or is our wisdom rooted in God? Is our wisdom rooted in God's faithfulness? My preaching professor, I think, sums this up best when he reflects back to what Jesus was called to, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life and those who lose their life for their sake of the gospel will save it. And here's what he says about being rooted in the cross in Paul. It's how God could take the very worst thing that humanity could ever do Jesus' crucifixion, and turn it into the very best thing God ever did. How God could take the worst thing that we as humanity ever did and turn it into the best thing that God ever did. The danger with the love of our own rhetoric and our smooth talking is that we will use our own skills to downplay the scandal of the cross and our smooth persuasiveness to evade the roughness of God's grace. So often we can just say, yeah, we, we celebrate Christmas and Easter, and then we go about doing the other work. But Dr. Jeter reminds us the importance of the cross, reminds us that God took the very most difficult, messiest, worst things that humanity could do, and made it into the best thing, as we see on Easter morning, and we live into that. It's interesting that as we wrap this up and we look at what it means to be grounded, Paul calls us to be grounded by being faithful in our work, remembering that God is God and we are not, to be intentional and go about our work with integrity, and to reflect God's holy, to let the Holy Spirit dwell in us and reflect that as we go out into the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, thank you for the reminder to live into your grace. Thank you for the reminder to reflect your light And as we do, help us to be intentional. Help us to act with integrity. Lord, that intentionality binds us together. You bind us together. You give us the seed. Help us to plant it. Help us to be the field hands that Paul reminds us we are to be. Help us to go forth and to honor and glorify you in all that we say, think, and do. Help us to be the church, Lord, to be your hands and feet, to act with wisdom, but to be rooted and grounded in your grace. In Jesus' name we pray as we reach out to pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
as we come to a close in worship this morning and you are wondering how you can seek the abundance of God's grace, the abundance of God's unconditional love and mercy, we want to invite you for a time of prayer here at the chancel rail. It is open for any and all to come to be grounded in God's grace and mercy as we go out into the week ahead. If you're looking for a church in which you can ground your faith and grow, I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Uh, Friend, as we stand to sing our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises of Christ, my King. prepare to go forward and be the church, we want to lift up a couple of ways in which you can grow in your faith in the days ahead. We are still participating in hurricane relief, so if you would like to help with those affected by Hurricane Helene or Milton, you can offer additional gifts online or during the service by simply notating disaster relief on the gift, and we will send those to the impacted areas through United Methodist Committee on Relief who are already on the ground and working diligently to help those in need. As Jeff is coming forward, I want to uh, share with you, there are some incredible music opportunities for you this week. Tuesday and Thursday here downtown at 10 a.m., Tuesday and Thursday, our sanctuary will be hosting two organ recitals as part of the East Texas Pipe Organ Festival. On Tuesday at 10, it will be Marshall Jones that will be performing on Thursday, Grant Smith, and Sung Kyung No, who will be playing. All three of these organ students are studying at Rice University and are free and open to the public. So if you have any questions, I would encourage you to talk to our wonderful organist, Paul, and to bring a friend and come and enjoy. And then on our West Campus on Wednesday, we're going to also have a special recital. 
Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Butler. I've been a cellist in the Houston Symphony for 38 years, and I've had the good fortune to play here many times. Uh, we have a very special chamber music concert at the West Campus Chapel Wednesday, uh, October 23rd at 7.30. Uh, it's a program of chamber music, but it's something beyond that. It's an intentional act of love for a young boy who was paralyzed with a rare disease three years ago. He received spinal neurosurgery, and we helped raise money for the surgery. Now he needs physical therapy. So we are hoping you will attend. Admission is free, but we are looking for support to help this young man walk again. So thank you so much, and thank you to First Methodist. Thank you. Another way we can show our support is we have a mission trip coming up March 7th through the 14th of next year. We'll be traveling to Honduras and serving with Camino Ministry. Camino is the Central American Ministry Outreach that works to build housing for needy families in Honduras. All ages are welcome. Children under 13 will need to be accompanied by an adult, uh, but everybody else is also welcome. So if you have an interest, please contact Pastor Eric at epu at fmhouston.com. As we go forth this morning, I pray that you're able to enjoy God's abundance this week, his abundance of joy and peace and love beyond anything you can imagine. As we go out this morning, let us hear this blessing from the third chapter of Ephesians. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we could ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen.